2 Timothy chapter 3, just want to read one verse tonight, and that's going to be in verse 16. We finished this chapter last week, and I just want to say a few other things uh, pertaining to the Scriptures, and we're going to title this, I'm just going to title this King James Bible. He said here in verse 16, chapter 3, verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Heavenly Father, we do ask your blessings upon this time together tonight. We pray for thy guidance and thy help and thy leading. Lord, we ask all of these things in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Just going to title this the King James Bible. It was translated in 1611. We have sermons and articles, um, especially sermons on this many over the years in the history of this church. Uh, just to give you a few titles and uh, the articles I'll mention first. Most of you know where they're at and that we've written those. And I'm not a writer. I don't claim to be a writer. I don't even like writing. Uh, I would never write a book. I've wrote short articles. And uh, just it's, it's not me, but I've done it out of necessity, needing a few things just to hand out as uh, over the years. But some of the things we've done on the King James Bible is the Lord Jesus Christ in the King James Bible, 1983. These and thou's in the King James Bible, I think that was 83, 84. Uh, the, the King James Bible, 1611, that needs to be redone. We, pre we wrote one, and all these were sermons as well. Always preach the sermon first. Suppose contradictions in the King James Bible. Words easier to understand in the other versions, which they're, they're not, but that's the title of it. We got a sermon on that as well. Scriptures cannot be broken. And then the last one is 2000, and is either 13, 2015, titled the Queen James Bible. I'll mention that again in a few moments. Um, we have a lot. Uh, we have less than we used to have, but I have the articles here beside me. But we also have a lot of, one of my favorites of uh, pamphlets is the new eye-opener that we have, and we've had that in there for years. It's just, it's just, I love the way it's laid out, and uh, you don't really need anything else, but we've got some here on the Deed of Christ, the New International Version. I uh, used to even have more in there. There's just, I'm not going to call off all of these, but uh, we have had a lot of these over the years. And with archaic words that people complain about, we've had this in there for years too, the King James Bible Companion. Many years we've had that in there. And it's got over 500 archaic words and uh, helps us with a definition. It's interesting that uh, vocations that people can have, they'll learn the language. Uh, every one of us in the vocation we have, there's language. Even in the simplicity of being a brick mason years ago, there was uh, language associated with it. Um, uh, we didn't talk about a, uh, a row of brick. We talked about a course of brick. We used certain uh, words in that vocation. And so with the King James Bible, we just need to learn some of the archaic words and the definitions of them. We spoke a little bit last week on inspiration, revelation, and preservation. And again, uh, the sermons, and I, I'm not going to read off all of these, but... Uh, I counted over 24, 25 sermons, just dealing with a number of things. Um, this subject here, we got one whole sermon, Revelation, Inspiration, Preservation. Uh, the King James and the NIV, the importance of the King James, the Bible and history, the Bible and science, the Bible and prophecy. Uh, we got a whole message just on the Queen James Bible I mentioned in a few moments, reasons for believing the King James Bible. And again, we dealt with the canon of Scripture. We've dealt with the, the translators of the King James Bible, the apocrypha in the King James Bible, uh, objections to the King James Bible, um, the these and thous, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in the King James Bible. We've just dealt with a lot of stuff, the traditional text and the King James Bible. And I am no 
uh, authority on the Hebrew and Greek. I've never claimed to be. I'm still struggling with the English language. And uh, I'm not proud of that, but it's just the way it is. But I'm no authority on the Hebrew and Greek. Don't claim to be. that. I've, there's many books and many people out there that I could give you the names of them that's done extensive work on this, and uh, especially dealing with Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. But one thing I can do, I can see the difference in the English Bibles. That's one thing I know for sure, and I'm going to point some of those things out tonight. I believe the King James Bible is God's Word to the English-speaking people, and there's been, uh, I believe, millions of souls saved in many, many revivals over the last um, uh, 400 years plus. It's from reliable sources, from the Hebrew and the Greek, and there is different lines of manuscripts. The, the King James comes from one. Uh, the other Bibles, uh, modern versions, come the, from the other line. that's referred to as the corrupt lines. Now, in Proverbs 25, 23, when we got to that passage weeks ago, we showed that by changing one word, not verses, but by changing one word uh, in the text with the other Bibles, it changes or reverses the meaning. Just one word. We spent one Wednesday night on that. There's a man uh, that uh, I listened, somebody told me about a sermon, wanted me to uh, listen to it. This has been probably six months ago, but the sermon, I forget uh, how many years, not all that many years uh, old. But he preached a whole sermon in his church before thousands, and he's in, in the reform movement. And he preached a whole sermon to show that Mark, 9, Mark 16, verses 9 through 20 should not be in the Bible. And that's interesting. That's 12 verses, the latter part of the book of Mark. And it speaks of resurrection, uh, Christ appearing to his disciples, the commission that he gave to his disciples, his ascension, and still yet, we, we dealt with this a number of years ago, why it should be in the Bible. But this is a man speaking before thousands, and actually probably worldwide. He's on television and radio, not only this country, but all over the world, and telling people that these verses should not be in the Bible. And his college ended up, they produced a translation uh, that they use now. I think it was done this year, either last year. But again, that's sad to me when I hear people do that, trying to tell people this should not be in the Bible. When, if you go back far enough, the early church writers, I don't really call them fathers, but the early church writers, they spoke of the latter part of Mark chapter 16. That's in the second and third century. They had those texts. And we have people today say that these should not be there. The modern English versions, most of them remove not only many words, but even whole verses. I want you to notice as we turn to 1 John, I'm just going to read a few passages tonight, make some comments. And behind me here I have uh, this. I've had it for many years. Uh, this is the uh, eight uh, translations of the New Testament that you can easily compare with. And this here is a copy of the 1611 edition of the King James Bible. If you've never seen one of those, you can look at it. I've got two different ones. And you can even see how the words were spelled, you know, back then. There's some words that are spelled different. Now, I want you to notice as we come to 1 John chapter 5. Now, I'm going to read verse 7. It's the only verse I'm going to read tonight for time's sake. We have preached an entire sermon uh, on this. As a matter of fact, I think we've got two or three. But a sermon we just did in 2022, two years ago, I titled it, The Importance of 1 John 5, 7 and the King James Bible. And uh, the reason I'm turning to this, this is a Trinitarian text and, or a Trinitarian statement. And it's omitted in most of the modern uh, English versions uh, today. It's just completely taken out. And we showed that it is supposed to be here in the sermon we preached two years ago and went back from the early church writers and come through uh, church history. 
Now, this verse we're going to read is a very, very important verse. And every major occult and false religions uh, remove this verse, or they change this verse. And they, false religions and occults, they deny the trinity and the divinity of Jesus Christ. Those are two major things that is important to Christianity. For instance, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, the Moonies, Islam, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, they all deny the deity of Christ. They deny the Trinity. All uh, false religions, major cults, they deny the, the Trinity and the deity of Christ. Early church writers, the first eight centuries of church history, they spoke of this text. And then we hear people today say it shouldn't be there. The first English Bible uh, to um, remove this verse was the Revised Version, 1881, which was based on the corrupt Greek text, Westcott and Hort. And notice as we read this, and I'll just, again, you'll see the importance uh, of this. It said in verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Can you imagine removing this out of Holy Scripture when it's been in there from the beginning? Well, notice with me in the book of Acts in chapter 7. In the book of Acts in chapter 7. I got some quotes. I don't know we'll get to them tonight. But if we don't, they're in all these sermons I mentioned to you earlier. Now notice in Acts chapter uh, 8. What did I tell you first of all? I want to go to I want to go 8, chapter 8. And I want to take one verse, and that's verse 37. Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. Now here's another verse that's taken out of most of the modern English uh, translations today. And again, it's a verse that's not only dealing with salvation of the soul, but it's dealing again with the divinity of Jesus Christ. It's a key verse, again, pertaining to the Savior and to salvation, and it is missing in many modern versions. Now, I'm going to pick out one in particular, the New International Version. We just refer to it as the NIV, and it removes this verse. It's one of the most popular English uh, versions by many people. And notice as I read this, verse 37, verse 37. He says here, And Philip said, If thou believest... With all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is a uh, eunuch from Ethiopia, beginning in verse 26. He's at Jerusalem worshiping. He's leaving, going back. He's in his chariot. And the Lord sent Philip uh, to go and minister to him. And he's sitting in his chariot reading uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 53, and Philip comes to him and asks him if he understands it. And uh, so Philip begins preaching to him, explaining this unto him. Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doeth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water. Uh, let me back up. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Let me just read verse 39. And when they came, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So verse 37 is an extreme, well, all verses are important. But this verse is dealing with salvation of the soul and dealing with the deity of Christ. Now, let me just focus in uh, for a moment on the 
NIV, the New International Version. Not only does it remove, and this is, I've not counted all these up, but I think it's very close. Not only has it removed 64,576 words, that's over 8%, and that's equal to several books of the Bible, like from the book of Acts to the book of Revelation. Not only has it removed that many words, but there's about 17 complete verses that it takes out. And this is one of them right here. It takes, uh, and I don't try to write these down, I'm just going to go through them quickly. But it takes out Matthew 17, 21, Matthew 18, 11, Matthew 23, 14, Mark 7, 16, Mark 9, 46, Mark 11, 26, Mark 15, 28, Luke 17, 36, Luke 23, 17, John 5, 4, Acts 15, 34, Acts 24, 7, Acts 28, verse 29, Romans 16, 24, and 1 John 5, 7. Now, the, all of these are in some of these pamphlets, so that's the reason I went through them quickly. No need to write those down. Now, what is interesting, the NIV removes these, these three words, the Lord Jesus Christ, 194 times. And the Living Bible removes them about 480, I'm sorry, 438 times. Now, the word sodomite is not found in the NIV. You can find it in the King James Bible, such as Deuteronomy 23, 17. That's the reason I use the word, because it's a biblical word. Now, if I'm talking to somebody that don't know the Bible, don't believe it, I may use another word. I hardly ever have used the word gay because there's nothing happy about uh, the sin of sodomy and Amen. immorality. Amen. But the word sodomite is not found in the NIV. Dr. Virginia Mollingott, a liter literary critic on the NIV, was a lesbian. She said this in June 1991 in a religious magazine, my lesbianism has always been a part of me. She also said the Bible does approve homosexual behavior, and she further claimed that God knowingly created her as a lesbian, so it is not sin. This is a literary critic on the uh, translation of the NIV. And also, and you can write these down, Revelation 1.11, here's what it takes out in reference to Christ. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. It takes that out. Verse 8 of Revelation 1, it takes out the beginning and the ending. Just takes it out in reference to Christ. And also where the washed in the, in the blood, Revelation 1.5, it takes the word washed out. It just, it just completely uh, removes it. Now, I want you to notice with me in Psalms uh, 119, we read a couple of verses here last week, but notice in Psalms 119, I want to read verse 40. The whole psalm is dealing with the Word of God, the longest chapter of the Bible dealing with the Word of God. But notice in Psalms 119, uh, notice with me in verse um, 40, and then we're going to turn to Psalms 8. He says here in verse 40, and again, every verse here is praising the Scripture, the Psalm of David. He said in verse 40, The word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. And again, we see statements like this. We read verse 89 last week. It said, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Again, we see that the word of God is perfect. It is pure. It's been preserved, as we read in Psalms 12. Now notice with me in Psalms 8, in Psalms 8. Now this is just kind of moving around to different, uh, different subjects, but again, we've tried our best to cover these as thorough as we could in different sermons. Now notice in Psalms 8. Now let me make mention of the New King James Bible just for a moment. I was speaking to someone about this just about a week or so outside the church. It makes over 100,000 word changes. I know that when they produced that Bible, they told us they're just 
they're just uh, t removing a few things like the these and thous and changing those. But no, there's over 100,000 word changes. The word hell is taken out 23 times and replaced. It omits the word Lord 66 times, the word God 51 times, the word heaven 50 times, the word repent 44 times, the blood 23 times. Jehovah is entirely taken out. And in the New Testament, the word devils and damnation is entirely taken out. Now we've got here in this stack, I think there's an entire pamphlet written by someone else uh, on the New King James Bible. Pretty sure there's one here. If I don't have it up here, it's in the it's in the library, and so it's so that is um, uh, that'll give you the, some of the information. Now, let me say something about the Queen James Bible. I know you don't like to hear those words, but the Queen James Bible was released in November 2012. Now, listen to this. It only alters eight verses, which is about 22 words changed. I preached a message on this, and I wrote an article on it as well. You, and, and the article is there in the library, and we deal with the changes that they made in it. Now think about this. The New King James Bible, it makes over 100,000 word changes. The Queen James Bible, nobody would want to carry that, and they've altered, though, only eight verses and about 22 words that have been changed. And we go through each one of those in the article and in the sermon and give some, some history on that. I went in a, in a Bible bookstore uh, when I was writing the article and preaching the sermon. I went in, and I was looking around. They said, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm looking for a Queen James Bible. They looked at me like I was from outer space. I wasn't going to buy one. I just wanted to see if they had it. And I don't think most bookstores ever, ever used it. But I've told uh, several people over the years, if you don't like the King James, you just have to use another translation. Don't go to the New King James. Go to the Queen James because it has less mistakes in it. I'm kind of joking, but still it's true. It is true. It has less mistakes in it. But, you know, and, and who was it that uh, changed those um, verses? It was sodomites. <clears throat> it's those that are involved in immorality. Now notice here, I'm just going to read one verse. I'm going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to read one verse here and in Psalms 23. And we're going to go to Luke and Revelation and close. This is just kind of a brief overview just to remind us of the importance of the book that we have in our hand tonight. In Psalms <clears throat> chapter 8, uh, go back and read the whole uh, psalm later, short psalm, but notice just verse 1. Now, the reason for coming here, and that is the beauty of the these and thous in the King James Bible. First article I wrote in um, 1983 was the Lord Jesus Christ, the King James Bible. The second one, and this one I was in Pennsylvania uh, pastoring, and the second one was the these and thous. I actually went to a library and spent... I think I mentioned this in the sermon. I have every article as a sermon. And I went to a library in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, spent all day uh, searching records um, of the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. <clears throat> in other words, people tell us we don't need to these and those. Um, uh, we don't speak that away anymore. Well, you'll find that most people didn't just walk around all the time in the 14, 15, 1600s and say, how art thou today? Can I go with thee? Now, some may have done that, but uh, I, I looked at court cases and I documented those that they speak much like we to today with the you and the your and things like that. But what we find is that we find the beauty of the these and thous in the King James Bible. And notice, let me just read verse 1. He says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thine glory, thy glory rather, above the heavens. When we come to the King James Bible, we see that the T's, are singular. 
The thee, thou, thine, and thine is singular. We serve what? A singular God, do we not? One God. And he's always referred to this way, right here. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy, thy name, not your name, thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. You'll see this all the way through the Bible. That's a beautiful thing. It's interesting, the critics that have come along, is like the New King James, we're just going to update it a little bit. No, they didn't just update it. They changed a lot in it. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and here's the thing about it, is that the T's are singular, thee, thou, thine, and thine, and the Y's are plural, ye, you, your, and yours. And so you can come to the Bible and I believe this is true all through it. I, you know, I've never checked every time. But you can find out whether one person is being addressed or more than one. And God is always referred to as thee or thou. In other words, he's not referred to, hey, you. And so we see the reverence there. And we serve one God, not many gods. And I think one of the greatest passages that you'll see this is in Luke 22, around verse 14, at least in the context of that. And you'll find in the upper room, Jesus is with his disciples, and he moves back and forth from you and thee. In other words, he's addressing the disciples, and then he addresses Peter and comes back to the disciples. And you know when he's talking to all of them or when he's talking to Peter by himself. And you'll notice as you read through the book of Romans and Corinthians, as Paul writes those letters of the church, again, you and your, things of that nature. And when he's talking to Timothy, we've seen in First, Second Timothy and Titus, he used the word thee and, and thou, uh, as we know that he's speaking uh, to one individual, or we know that he's speaking to a church or to a group of individuals. And I think, I just think that's a, a wonderful thing. The King James Bible preserves the distinction between the singular and plural pronouns. I think it's a beautiful thing. Other people may hate it. What is interesting, the critics uh, will criticize our Bible that we have in our hand tonight and see if they, they love to sing how great thou art. Isn't that interesting? They love to sing that and then criticize the King James Bible. And many people love to quote Shakespeare, but criticize the King James Bible. Notice in Psalms 23. In Psalms 23. Now, another thing, and uh, I don't know if we have an entire sermon on it. We have uh, in other sermons, but italicized words. Uh, we find that the, here, we're going to see here that the, in verse 1, I'm only going to read one verse in Psalms 23, the word is, is added to complete the sentence, which makes sense to the English reader. From one language to another, from Hebrew to, English to, to Greek to English, so forth, we find that the King James translators were honest. They tell you when a word is added to, to make sense coming from one language to another. Most other Bibles don't do that. Maybe none of them do it. Uh, they just add stuff and same, same text. But notice here, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The word is is added. It's, in a, it's italicized, and so the translators are telling you that uh, it is added. Turn with me to the book of Revelation in chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Now if you're taking notes tonight, Luke 24, 44, Jesus gives the three divisions of the Old uh, Testament. Uh, Jesus always testified unto, unto the Old Testament. Um, looking for an article here that I want to use something in it. Now notice as we come to Revelation 22, I'm just going to close here. Now I wrote an article and preached a sermon. I don't even have the date on it, so it's been a long time ago, titled Words Easier to Understand in the Other Versions. What I did, I put 54 uh, scripture verses in here and the words that are used. 
And I'm just going to use one, the very first one I put here. This is one I remember the most when I'm talking to people. And what I did, I took the King James Version and compared it with a Revised Standard Version, New International Version, New American Standard Version, New King James Version, and the New Revised Standard Version. And uh, here's the King James, and then I'm going to give you the Revised Standard Version. The King James says in Job 6, verse 6, white of an egg. I know what that is. Amen. The Revised Standard Version says, slime of the purslane. I don't know what that is. I still don't know what it is after all these years of being saved. So I go through 54 changes in some of these versions, and they don't help you at all. So... The new versions are not always have e words easier to understand. Again, this is the reason I mentioned this little booklet that we've had in the library for many, many years, the King James Bible comparison, over 500 archaic words defined. And so that'll help us. And I, I still, as a minister, run into words that I have to go and look up the definition. That's one of the reasons I have an 1828 Webster's Dictionary. I still have to go and look them up. And even sometimes I know it and I just forget it, especially as I get older. Well, notice I'm going to read in Revelation very familiar verses and, and we're, going to, we're going to close. Now, things that we need to consider is, uh, again, the canon of Scripture. Um, again, we've preached on the Apocrypha and the King James Bible. I have not written anything on that. Uh, supposed contradictions. We have a sermon, an article on that. Supposed contradictions, where there might be a, a number of certain people given in one place. I, I could give you an example. I got the article here. And another passage might seem to say something else. But when you really think about it and, and look at it, there are no contradictions in the King James Bible. But I title it, Supposed Contradictions. Even objections to the King James Bible. People say, well, the word charity shouldn't be in there. They'll say the word devils shouldn't be there. It should be demons or something else. I use the word demons sometimes, but the Bible, King James Bible, uses the word devils. And it's best probably to use that. The word atonement in Romans 5.11. People say it shouldn't be there. It should be another word like reconciliation the word Easter in Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. Now, I believe that um, many people's got that wrong that do even believe the King James Bible because I had it wrong before. But the critics will say the word Easter should not be there. Well, many in our circles say, well, it should be there, but it's referring to a pagan holiday. And I wrote an article in 2009 and preached a sermon. I just did a lot of research on that. I believe the word Easter is a good word. It's associated with the resurrection, and it's not a pagan uh, word. And so I, I spent a lot of time on that. Uh, Jesus is called that holy thing. And I could go on with a list of words that people will criticize the King James Bible. Again, the deity of Christ, the divinity of Christ, the Trinity is attacked and many of these other translations, as we just seen in 1 John 5 and verse 7. I got a whole sermon in 2011 on the translators of the King James Bible. It's amazing to just look at these men. There were 54 scholars, and the preference, you can especially, it may not be in all your Bibles, but in this one here for sure, and I got a, some Bibles in the preference of the King James Bible shows their commitment to God's Word, the epistle dedicatory, and the translators to the reader, which were included with the publication of the authorized version. And again, it's amazing at some of the things that they said. And uh, just part of a quote, and this is actually a quote from someone else, speaks of these 54 translators. It said of the 54 translators, four were college presidents, six were bishops, five were deans, 30 held PhDs, 39 held master's degrees. There were 41 university professors, 13 were masters of the Hebrew language, 
and 10 had mastered Greek, uh, every man involved in the King James translation believed in the verbal inspiration of the scripture and all believed in the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. These were praying men. And, uh, and these translators considered themselves, I'm quoting, poor instruments to make God's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto the people. There have never probably been a Bible anywhere, any time uh, that's had this much scholarship put into it. And again, you can read uh, the dedicatory and read the, their words to the readers, their words to the king, and so forth, and they were very serious about this. They believed the scripture. They never denied any of it, never tried to correct it. They believed it. So I'm saying to you, you've got God's word in your hands here tonight. Well, notice as we close, and there's much more I could say. I've got material laying everywhere up here. <laughs> there's much more I could say, but I think this is enough because, like I say, and there's, there's people that's written on this. I've given books away over the years. I've had probably 30 or 35 books um, on the King James Bible. I've talked more than once with the Trinitarian Bible Society in England. I've talked with experts in Australia, all throughout the United States and Canada, and those who are more of authority. I've actually, when I was studying certain subjects, uh, I actually made phone calls. I called the Trinitarian Bible Society on two different subjects and uh, wanted to talk to their scholars, and it, it was, had to do with a couple of Bible subjects and also the Tyndall translation, the King James translation. And I asked them a question, and they said, we've never had that question uh, given to us before. I never told them why I was asking it, uh, but I asked them a question, and they said, let us get back with you. Let us consult with some of the scholars and get back with you, and they did within a week. And so, I, so there's many authorities out there that do a great job on this. I'm not one of them. I just believe this book. Amen. And, uh, and my goal is to try to convince others to just believe it. Amen. Well, notice the warning given in Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. We've read this many times. And, but I take this warning serious. This is God's holy word we have in our hands. And he said, For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. God is serious about his word, is he not? We're to believe it. We're to trust in him. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we do thank you tonight again for your wonderful love to us, and you loved us enough that you preserved your word, and Lord, that you've given it to us in our language. We just thank you for that. We ask now, Lord, your blessings to be upon the singing, the closing prayer, for it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.